So the Trudophyta, our last group from, for next week and the biggest one by far of these other. So in the Trudophyta, there's maybe at least 10,000 species. Where, you know, there, if, I don't think there's even 100 species of Equisetum worldwide. Uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 maybe worldwide. So there's a lot more ferns than there are any of the other groups. So this is not only a group that was more prominent in the past. I mean, there were huge ferns in the past, forests of ferns. There still are in some places of the world, but even larger in the past. But they've retained a good representation in our contemporary flora. The word, of course, phyta for division, teri means fern. So these ferns are the fern plants. So they've been around a long time, enough to have their own, their own names here. The tritophyta have megaphils. And now they're really big megaphils. Sometimes these big megaphils are only you know, the size of your hand or smaller, but some, there are ferns, they're actually tree ferns, and a leaf of a tree fern could easily be the size of this screen. Here, at least the length of that screen maybe not quite as wide, but you, know, you got the idea. They are big leaves, really big leaves. So they're not leaving any doubt that these are megaphils. But the technical definition is not big leaf, it is technical definition of megaphil. No gap in the stem where the leaf is attached, except there is a gap in the leaf in the stem where it's attached. Microphil is there's no gap. So there is a gap in the stem vasculature where the leaf is attached, and there's multiple veins in the leaf. So when, so when I say there's no doubt that they're megaphils, they are awful, also awfully big in some of the turidophyta. There's what we're going to call three groups of the Tritophyta. Now, these are not officially recognized groups in the classification. These are just kind of my own classification that's going to help you understand the main groupings, the main types of ferns that we have. There are tree ferns, which unfortunately we're not going to be able to study very much in this class. We might have a real small tree fern that we can bring into lab. And you sometimes find them in um, in Lowe's or in other stores, you may find sometimes a tree fern. But they don't like our climate. Our climate is much too dry for them. Even in the summer, it's much too dry here. So they're plants of rainfo of rainforests, of tropical, of more tropical areas. But in Hawaii, you do find there are native tree ferns in Hawaii. And in fact, you can walk through little forests of tree fern in Hawaii. And certainly in Central and South America, there are tree ferns. The second group is I'm going to call the woodland ferns. The woodland ferns are just the ferns you would go out and you see in a mesic woodland. And many tropical ferns would fit into this group. As I say, these are not official groups. They just have a different kind of stem than the tree ferns. So the tree ferns are going to have an upright stem that's way above, that's um, thick and supports a big canopy of leaves, sometimes 20 or more, 30 feet above the ground. The woodland ferns are going to, in general, have relatively small stems, often underground stems as rhizomes, sometimes a little bit of an above ground stem, but the main stems are underground on this. And then finally, the water ferns are very distinctive from these. It's a very small group of ferns that I'm calling the water ferns. And they are distinguished from these other two ferns in that these ferns, the tree ferns and the wood ferns, are homosporous. And the water ferns are heterosporous. So <clears throat> we could and probably really should call these the homosporous and the heterosporous ferns. But I'm just making this differentiation to help you picture what these things look like a little, be a little better. We're not going to talk about the water ferns very much. We'll come to the back to them near the end of the lecture, which means not today, and talk about the heterosporous ferns just very slightly. Now, the, the homosporous ferns. The homosporous ferns in the, in the Trudophyta have a different kind of sporangium. 
Remember I've said that we, almost everything we're doing the whole semester, that means almost all the extant land plants, have eusporangium. And the definition of a eusporangium is True, oh, the, the roots, yeah, so a true sporangium or a good sporangium, what's, what characteristics does it have? This is why you take notes. Lots of spores or just a few spores? Lots, Lots of spores. Thick, ma, you got it, multiple cells in the wall, thick cell walls, okay? I'm not writing it up here because the tritophyte do not have eusporangium. They have the opposite characteristic. So if it doesn't have multiple cells in the cell wall, it has how thick is the cell wall? Really thin, really, really thin, like not multiple, it would be single cell layer. So the cell wall is gonna be a single cell layer. If it doesn't have thousands of spores, it's got few, very few spores, and usually only up to about 64. And these are called slender sporangia, sporangia. It's not the greatest term. I mean, it's not the greatest translation, but the term is cool. It's lepto, lepto slender sporangia. So few spores, let's define that usually. only up to about 64. Notice that's a multiple of two. You can explain to your neighbor sometime why it's a multiple of two. And a few spores and a cell wall or a sporangial wall. Consisting of a single cell layer. So these are really small sporangia compared to the leptosporangia. This is the genus Tridium, one of the woodland ferns. So we'll start there next time. So last time we left off with the Tridophyta, and we said that these were the, the ferns, that they were mostly homosporous, not all homosporous, but the main groups, the tree ferns and the woodland, what I'm calling the woodland ferns are homosporous. And then there's this one group, the water ferns, which we'll talk about at the end of the lecture, which is heterosporous. They've also got a different kind of sporangium. You remember the main kind of sporangium we've been talking about are the eusporangium. And that has thousands of, oh, that's supposed, that says species, thousands of spores. Just make it say what I want. Whereas the leptosporangium, the slender sporangium, has few spores, and the sporangial wall consists of a single layer, whereas the eusporangium has, that's greater than one layer in the wall, in its wall. <clears throat> and the leptosporangium then, only one layer. So they're really, they really look different. They're really completely different in form. So they're not gonna be hard to tell apart when we see them. And we'll look at them as we go on with this discussion of the tritophyta. So here's our first tritophyta. This is tritium, um, the bracken fern. It's a very common fern in slightly northern regions. It's also a very, um, it adapts well to disturbance and change. And so areas which have been affected by climate change, for instance, I'm told, you know, the highlands in Scotland, I was there in the 70s and it used to be covered with heath. Um, members of the family, Eric Casey, if you take the next, the next class, Plant Systematics, you'll learn about that family, but it's a family of flowering plants. Very common in the highlands. I'm told that the highlands now are covered with brackets for our bracken probably due to climate change and different um, environmental patterns that have happened and deforestation, all kinds of different effects would have do that. But anyway, I'm just trying to say it's something that is almost weedy in its 
and how ubiquitous it is. It's, it occurs very frequently. So what we're seeing then in this fern, this is all the sporophyte. And the gametophyte is separate from this and grows independently, like all the other lower vascular plants we've been talking about. So if we look at our typical life cycle, we find meiosis and fertilization, and we divide our life cycle into the diploid <coughs> and haploid portions. Here is the gametophyte, the mature gametophyte. Now that gametophyte is sometimes also called a prophallus. It's an older name for it, and you know the roots for prophallus. It's not a great name, but you will sometimes see that in textbooks, and I think it's on the material that we get from Carolina. We'll be actually looking at these gametophytes. This is the only group where we actually have the gametophytes, and you can see them in lab. And sometimes you can even see the archegonia and the antheridia on them. And they are sometimes labeled prothallus, not gametophyte. Same structure. On the diploid side, we have the sporophyte, the diploid organism, which is going to bear the sporangium. There's an, excuse me, an immature sporangium, but there's a sporangium that's going to bear the spores then inside that sporangium. So the, the structures, the morphology, those are different, but the basic organization of the life cycle is the same as we've seen, a typical dibionic life cycle of the land plants. We said that there's three different kinds of ferns, three different types of ferns. Here's a tree fern. This is growing in Costa Rica. It's a little dark there. You can look at it on your, on your computer. This was taken, I took this picture a long time ago in Costa Rica on a 35 millimeter film and we scanned it, which is why it looks a little bit weird here, so it's a much older picture. But you can see up here are the the leaves, and we have a special name for the leaves in the ferns. They're called fronds. There's a special name for everything in the ferns. Because there are about 10,000 species, that means there's enough species for people to make their career studying the ferns. And whenever you've got people studying like that, studying a group of organisms, you should expect now, by now, that they're going to have their own terminology for it. So they do have their own terminology for the tree ferns. There's the fronds, and there is a large trunk here. We are just going to call it a trunk. And that trunk does not have any secondary growth. It does not grow in girth. It only, it's all that thickness of the trunk. Is, it was that thick when the plant was little, and it's that thick when it's this tall. So it doesn't increase in girth over the life of the plant, but the plant does grow upwards. So they're pretty amazing plants, these tree ferns. They're very cool and incredible when you first see them. We also said that there were the water ferns, and here is an example of a water fern. Can you see that? Not very well. And this is, so this is one of the heterosphorous ferns. This is actually the genus Azola. We'll come back to that later on. And in the back here is a woodland fern. One of the homosporous ferns like the tree ferns. And you can see a little bit of, this, of the difference in size here. The woodland ferns vary in size, but they're always kind of moderately sized. And the water ferns, this one especially, is very small. That's not true to scale, this is probably Relevant to that, this is probably twice as big, about twice as big as it should be. Maybe a little more than that even. So here's a typical woodland fern that would occur in North, such as would occur in North Carolina. This is a very common fern in North Carolina. This is the Christmas fern. I think it's called the Christmas fern because if you go out at Christmas time into the woods of North Carolina, there's pretty much nothing green on the forest floor except this fern. And it looks like an elephant came along and stepped on it. So it could be called the elephant step fern too, but it's not. 
called the Christmas fern. Although I've been told by an old member of the biology department, we used to take students out in the woods a lot. You see that little leaf there? You see that shape of the leaf? He said, you see it's the Christmas fern because that looks like Santa's sleigh. There's Santa, the reindeer. <laughs> The, our different names for all of the different parts of the fern, as we said, the leaf is called the frond. The central axis of the leaf is called the rachis. These leaflets that I've just circled here, those are called the pinna. And I'm not gonna ask you on an exam to memorize all of these things, but you at least have to have a little bit conversationally familiar with these in case you would counter these terms in a textbook, you should know that you know the rachis is the midrib of the leaf, the frond is the leaf, the pinna are the leaflets, etc. So everything we see above ground here, this is all, all of that above ground, that's all leaf. Underneath the ground we have a rhizome. I think that's going to be seen in the next picture. Well, not quite yet. We'll start, let's stay above ground. We are going to show you the rhizome in a minute. These plants have a very unusual way of opening their leaves, which somewhat adjusts our, somewhat justifies our giving them that special name. And you see here, this leaf is kind of curled up, and here it is unf unfurling. You see here's the leaflets down here, and it's still curled up at the top. This process of unfurling of the leaf is called, it's got a very complex name, but it's a very cool process. It's called circinate, which has the same root as circle, vernation. And vernal means spring. And A-T-I-O-N is an action word. So it's circinate, circling in the spring. So what these things do then, they, they're all controlled, they're all rolled in on themselves and in the spring, they unroll, kind of like I'm trying to show you with my body there. Very cool to watch, although they don't do it in the time that, you know, you can't watch them unless, unless you have time-lapse photography. And you probably can find that on the, on the web. If you Google Circinate Vernation movie, you might be able to find it. Here it is again, this is the fern frond that is all rolled up, different species here. And you notice that that looks like that bishop staff. Remember we talked about the bishop staff when we talked about the crozier formation in the Ascomycota. That didn't look much like a bishop's task, but a staff, but it was turned curled over. This really does look like a bishop's staff, and it's not coincidental the bishop staffs were modeled after these ferns. These fiddle, these, so these are also called croziers. A crozier, or also called a fiddlehead, for obvious reasons, I hope. And I have actually tasted these. You can eat these. Um, I don't, as far as I know, there are no poisonous ferns. But you have, you take them and you guess what? You take them and you fry them in butter. And just like my dad said, if you put enough butter on Julia Child, you know. God bless her, if you put enough butter on anything, it tastes good, and they were, so they were pretty good. At least not bad. If you go out and you eat fiddleheads, it's not my fault if you get sick, okay? Just remember that. I'm not telling you to eat fiddleheads. I'm just saying that I know people who have. Here's the soil. Here's a rhizome underneath the soil. This is tritium again, and this is all leaf. Or we should say more correctly, frond. So in the woodland ferns, we have above ground portions, which would be the frond, and then below ground is the rhizome, so all the stem material. In almost all cases of the woodland ferns is below ground. There's exceptions, of course, but most, very most cases. Here's some more tree ferns. There's my picture. Again, but the other ones you can see are in different regions of the world. They almost look like palms, but the leaves don't look quite right. 
way back in the Devonian, they had plants that looked like these that looked really like this, except they had seeds on the leaves. The seeds were then born on these leaves. They're called the seed ferns. And they were intermediates then between the ferns and the existing seed plants. Perhaps we should say they are some of the first seed plants. Here's our leptosporangia. So you see they're very distinctive from the eusporangia we've been seeing. They have some special features, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we can see here that there are a few spores, only up to about 64. So 64 is usually the maximum number of spores here. And you can also see that the cell, the wall here, the wall of the sporangial, sporangium is one cell. And you can see through the sporangium then when the spores are gone. There's a structure on the side of this. This looks like a little mohawk here. That structure is called the ring, the annulus. And it functions in the, the dispersal of the spores in a way that I'll describe in a little bit. But right now, we just wanted to look at the leptosporangium and see that it's very small and looks quite different from the eusporangium. So this is a eusporangium in some of the ferns. Both the leptosporangia and the eusporangia are going to be on the backs of leaves. This is a cluster of eusporangia. There it is up close. And this is a single eusporangium. And you can see it here in section. There's the thick cell wall, thick sporangial wall. And you can get a sense a little bit, I'm not sure complete sense, but there's a lot of spores in there. There's not just a few, so there's thousands of spores. So all the plants we've seen up until now have eusporangia. Everything we see after we get out of the ferns are going to have eusporangia. It's just this one group. And not all the members of the trutophyta, but almost all of them have leptosporangia. There's a few, like this one, which have eusporangia. Here's a eusporangium. Thousands of spores in there. They've fallen out in this case because when the section was cut, cut they came out of the sporangium. And then the, cell, the sporangial wall is greater than one cell layer. And you can see this got the current, these clusters also, but they are used for angio. This is a leaf up here. So there's a couple species that occur in North Carolina that are you have eusporangia. This is Ophioglossum. It's called the adder's tongue. I can never spell tongue. I say this every year, and you would think that I would learn from year to year, and I don't. OK, spell it for me. I don't know why that's so hard for me, but it is just impossible. So apparently, this looks like an adder's tongue. But if you get close enough to an adder to see what shape it's tongue in, I think you're probably in real trouble. So I don't recommend you check that out. There are two fronds. So this is, there's the sterile frond. And here's the fertile 
So that is really a leaf. That's a very highly modified leaf. And we have on that leaf Eusporangia. So there's basically no blade here, but there are Eusporangia on it. So these things vary in size, but there are some of these that are really tiny. There are some adder's tongues that are only about a centimeter in size. Here's the other one that is common in North Carolina. It's sometimes, it usually comes up in the very early spring and is fertile at that time. This is the genus Botrychium. Or the grape fern. You're a little safer in this case because you can get closer to a bunch of grapes and see if it looks like that. It does to somebody anyway. So there's the fertile frond. And here, I don't know if you can see it down there, but there's the sterile frond, the vegetative frond. And the one that's most common in North Carolina, this one has only one fertile and one sterile frond, like Ophioglossum does. Again, Eusporangia. And if we're lucky, we'll have it in Swore in lab today. Here's the more typical woodland fern. This is a leptosporangia fern. And you can see the fiddleheads, the crozier, they're also called the croziers, how that's unraveling there, the frond. And the sporangia, are on the lower side, on the abaxial side of the leaf. So the, if there are fertile fronds, sometimes you cannot tell the fertile from the sterile frond except by looking on the other side and seeing a sprange. In some cases, you can. In some cases, the fronds are dimorphic, two different forms, like we saw in Ophioglossum and Patrichium but sometimes they're not. So here we see there's, their, there's our sporophyte, and we look at the abaxial side of the leaf. And that's where we find the leptosporangia. And the leptosporangia occur in heaps. And we know the word for heaps already. Thesaurus, a sori, plural, or saurus for heaps. So they occur in these little masses of sporangia. We'll have some nice pictures of that in just a second. The spores are going to be shed, and this is a process of shedding them. But I know that picture doesn't make any sense yet. We will talk about that in a minute after we look at the sporangium itself. So here's a beautiful picture of the leptosporangium. I wish this was taken in lab, but it wasn't. So there on the back of this is the annulus. <coughs> There's about our 64 spores. Can you see that? Kind of. If you look here, you see there's some weird looking cells here. And they kind of look like lips. They're called the lip cells. And they are also going to function in the opening of the sporangium. And you can see this is this, sorry, this um sporangium has been cleared, so you can look through it. But the fact that you can clear it like this at all, you couldn't do this with the use sporangium easily, that means that the walls are thin. You can see that kind of here. As we look at the annulus, let's just look at it a little bit here, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. Look at the structure of these walls. These walls, this part of the wall is very thick. And this part of the wall is thin.
So that's very important. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that and show you how that thick and thin wall functions in the dispersal of the spores. These cells are also dead at maturity. So when the sporangia is mature and the spores are going to be shed, those cells of the annulus are dead. That's going to be important. They're dead and filled with water. Here's the leptosporangia again. This time we're seeing it on the one on the picture on the right in a different view so that you can see that it's a kind of a little fat here. You can't see that in the flat view, but you can also see the lip cells. You can see why they're called lip cells. They really look like lips in this case. Here's the annulus and the sporangia wall. which is only one cell thick. So nice to see these in a different view to give you a three-dimensional perspective. We said that on the abaxial side of the frond, so this is the frond, we would have sauri. So there are the clusters of sporangia. And you can see that there's really a lot of sporangia there. So each frangium has got very few spores, but there's just oh, hundreds at least of sporangia in each sorus, and then many sori on the back of a typical leaf. So you can see why the word heap is very appropriate here. They do look like little heaps. All right, so we're looking at the sori, and we're seeing that they sometimes have coverings on them. So first of all, let's look at the ones we've looked at already, like these over here, and we see that these are, my favorite word, naked, the naked sori, naked, which means they have no additional coverings over them. The spores are just directly exposed to the air on the underside, the abaxial side of the leaf. There are, however, plants, in fact, quite a few of the ferns, where there's a covering over the sorus. And that covering is called, a, a clo is called clothing or indusium, an indusium. I'll write it up here on the white sideways. Indusium, and it means clothed or clothing. So there are different types of indusia and different shapes of indusia. If you look at this indusium that I've just identified with the arrow, you see it's kind of connected at this point, and it's got this kind of kidney shape. So there are these kind of kidney shaped ones. There's special names for those. But I just point out that there are special shapes here. And then look over here at this fern, and you see the indusium and the sorus looks very different. It's on the margin of the leaf. And in fact, there's a little bit of the margin that's wrapped around. So if we look at that and let my arm be the undersurface of the leaf now, the margin of that leaf is wrapped around on top of the sorus. And that forms the indusium there. So this type of an indusium over here, this is called a false indusium. And this is called a true indusium. And there are many different shapes of the true indusia. This is just one of them, these kidney-shaped ones. The difference between the false and the true indusium is that the false, true indusium comes out of the center portion of the leaf. Right? You see, it's not the margin of the leaf that's wrapped around, whereas in the false indusium, it's the margin that's wrapped around. I think I've got another picture of that next. So here is a section of a true indusium. So there's our leaf up there. And on the abaxial surface, we find the whole thing is the sorus. And there's the indusium. You see this indusium is peltate. 
they're not all peltate, but this one is. And it's out, it's growing out of, the indusium is growing out of the lower surface of the leaf. So that's a true indusium. You should be able to see these very nicely in lab. Here's a false indusium. So here we have the margin of the leaf forming the indusium. So it's wrapped around on top of the sores. Oops, sorry. Okay, let's look at the sporangia now and look at how they open. So we've looked at this, we've looked at our sporangium, and we've seen that we have these cells with very thick walls and very thin walls. How does that function? Well, let's draw that cell out here. With, as it is in the sporangium initially. I'm drawing it kind of wide, but that's all right. So there's our thick wall. And up here, there's that thin wall. I'll just draw it as a red line. And the center of this then is filled with water. So it's completely hydrated, the wall too. And we'll just draw it in there, so there's water. And the water is going to evaporate as these the indusium pulls back off of the sporangia, or the sporangia just mature if it's a naked indusium. These cells die, and when they die, they can't regulate their water loss. So there's no active machinery there to keep the water in. So we get water evaporation. And as the water evaporates, a force is generated on the walls, right? So the walls are attached to the, are um, hydrated with the water. The water is disappearing and now, okay, I'm gonna use my body in several different ways now. So right now, let my arms be the walls of that annulus cell. And as the water evaporates out toward the ceiling, these walls get pulled in toward each other. So the hydrostatic, um, so I'm sorry, what I'm trying to say is the hydrogen bonds allow the water or cause the water to have a high coherence. It holds together very strongly. And it pull, as they pull it in, they, as the water evaporates, they pull the walls of the cell together. That's what's starting to happen here. They're starting to be pulled together. Look at here, they're being pulled together even more. So now, my torso is the annulus, and it's all my arms that are part of that annulus too, and it's all enclosing those spores, and as the cells of the annulus lose water, the thing opens up, and it's slowly pulling backwards, the spores are then all on this front part of me and they're all exposed to the air. And now at some point, that those wa the water gets so um, much tension, in other words, so much water is eva has evaporated, that this open sporangium cannot maintain its, can't stay open anymore. And so it springs forward, and as it springs forward, it throws the spores out. So that's what we're seeing in the last picture after the dehiscence. The spores are thrown. 
it just really happens mainly one time. It's not a thing that gets repeated a lot, but if you rehydrate the sporangia, sometimes in lab, if you see this, you can sometimes get them to do it a second time. Or if you get them just at the right stage, you can see them doing it the first time. Last semester, last year, students did see these things dehissing in lab. So just put them under those hot lights under your dissecting scope and you may see the spores being thrown this way. So it's a pretty cool dehiscence mechanism for our leptosporangia. And that's what we see here. We see the annulus pulled all the way back and the spores are going to be thrown out of the sporangium. The spores germinate. We get our gametophyte. The gametophyte has archegonia and antheridia. The archegonia are normally at the tip near this little notch and the archegonia, I'm oh, sorry, and the antheridia are usually down toward the roots. The gametophyte is growing from the notch, so it's growing this way out. So that means the antheridia are formed first and the archegonia are formed second. And that's gonna be very important. I hope it's the next slide. It's gonna be a slide after that. First of all, here's the spore germination. So just a very young stage of the gametophyte. And now we see that there are cases in which there are bisexual gametophytes. And cases in which there are unisexual gametophytes, and it's mainly the male here. And you notice that male gametophyte is not, doesn't look at all like the bisexual gametophyte. It has a very different form, and basically all those little spheres are antheridia. So it's just a little bit of tissue there, of sterile tissue, and then lots and lots of antheridia, more than here. So this is a very interesting situation where we have a plant which is homosporous. It's still homosporous, but it's producing, in some cases, two types of gametophytes. So that happens because there's hormonal regulation So the hormones produced by this first gametophyte. So let's, we have to think this through in time. So a spore is shed and it lands in an area and it starts to grow into a gametophyte. And it grows into this bisexual gametophyte. And it starts producing hormones that, that infuse the area. And those cause the other gametophytes in the area to be male. So there's hormonal, regula there's hormonal regulation of sex determination in these gametophytes, or there can be any. And we'll see that in lab when we look at a video. We have another nice video today, and it'll explain this in a little more detail. So that we have this strange situation where we have a homosporous plant, and in some cases, we still have two sexes of the gametophytes. But if you're, you know, if you're asked on a quiz and those things, you're at, it's the right answer is homosporous or heterosporous, it's homosporous. Here's a sperm, more weird sper looking sperm in the lower vascular plants. Look at all those flagella there. That's not the flagellum. This is part of the body of the sperm. Of course, this is the nucleus. And then many flagella coming off the side. And here we then have the gametophyte and the young sporophyte growing out of it. following fertilization. Usually only one sporophyte will come out of a gametophyte. And we have our life cycle then, and we've seen now I think all of the parts of the life cycle. Here's the archegonium with the egg, same kind of structure we've seen before. It's got the neck cells and the egg at the bottom of it. Here's the antheridium. Antheridium, again, same structure, jacket cells around the central core of cells that will produce the sperm. 
the sperm are released. They're dependent on water, like all of the lower vascular plants, and the sperm are gonna swim to the egg. And of course, if there is that hormonal regulation going on, they actually have to swim a distance across nature. They have to swim across the soil. So it has to, there has to be some water there for them to do that to reach the archegonium of another plant. The zygote is produced and at the base of the young of the young sporophyte, we have the foot, which is like in all the other vascular plants, the place of nutrient transfer between the gametophyte shown in yellow here and the sporophyte shown in green. Sporophyte grows out, produces the large free living sporophyte with its sporangia, leptosporangia. So aside from the Morphology, again, sim very simple life cycle that we've seen before, dibionic life cycle. I do want to say one more word about the need for water. Could even say that free water is necessary. And <clears throat> you can see that this would limit the areas in which the ferns can grow. The Fern itself, the mature sporophyte, might be able to grow in relatively dry areas. But to get any kind of reproduction, there has to be water present. So the ferns and the, all the lower plants are, are dependent upon this free water in the environment. What we're going to see in the next group in the seed plants are adaptations that have allowed the plants to escape the need for free water. So we can get plants growing now with these new adaptations in very dry environments. The mature sporophyte can survive in the dry environment or the cold environment, and it can reproduce in that environment too because it's got adaptations that allow it to get around the need for water that we find in the other lower vascular plants. Just complete our tour of the Tritophyta by talking very briefly about the heterosporous ferns, which we're calling the water ferns. They tend to be ferns of more wet places, or the one up, the clover-like looking one, that's not clover, that's a fern. That one is a little less dependent on water than the others. And let me see if I can remember their names. This is Azola. Um, this is Salvinia. Salvinia can be a real Pest, and this is Marsilia. This is the one we'll see in lab. So these are all heterosporous. Look at a couple diagrams of Marsilia. And you can see that the fronds have different morphologies. This top one is probably the most common morphology. You see the fronds look kind of leaf-like, I mean, sort of like, kind of clover-like. But if you watch them open, they would have circinate vernation. And down here on this other species of Marsilia, which doesn't have expanded pinna, it just has that rachis. The rachis is the photosynthetic part. You can see there, there is some circinate vernation shown there. The leaves are expanding in that same way we would expect from ferns. So that's one way, of course, we know that they're ferns. It's the only group that has circinate fernation. But of course, the reproduction is the big clue. And in this case, there are modified leaves, highly modified leaves. Fertile leaves. That contain the microsporangia and megasporangia. And I wish we could see those in lab. We can sometimes see those highly modified leaves, which by the way are called sporocarps.
<laughs> we can sometimes see them in lab, but they don't open. Um, I was very fortunate back in the age of the dinosaurs when I was going to graduate school, they had Carolina Biological Supply had a variety of these plants, of um, a race of these plants where the sporocarps would open very easily and you just pulled them off and you float them in water and we could see them in our diversity class, we could see them open very easily. And something happened and they lost that, that race and all the ones that we've had for the last 20 years at Green UNCG, the sporocarps do not open. I think we've tried a hammer one year to get them to open. They're very tough little things. So we can't see, we can't see those microsporangia and mygosporangia unless we have a miracle this year. <clears throat> but they are in those uh, hard sporocarps. And here we have our last slide. And again, we see some of the same species, um, Azola on the bottom too, and um, Marsilia, not Marsilia, Salvinia on the top. Salvinia is a very interesting plant. First of all, it can be a, a pest of waterways. It grows very well and reproduces very well. And the second reason is if you look at these hairs, so there's recurved hairs on the top of that. So each of the hairs on top looks like this. Kind of has these hooked hairs on top of it, almost like Velcro. <clears throat> and these hairs trap air. So if you take a salvinia and you push that leaf underwater, it goes boop, right back up. You cannot hold it. You'd have to put a weight on it to keep it underwater. And even if you did that and you took the weight off, it would go boop, right back up. So it traps a little air bubble in the top of there and so floats very well, which is probably one of the reasons why it can become a pest is because you can't submerge it. You can't drown this plant. 